who taught the sinner where to stand in the morning? And who told the ocean you can only come this far? And who showed the moon where to find to leave me? To falling star, for I know my redeemer lives. I know my redeemer lives. Let all creation. Right now, it is my happy privilege to turn the service over to our pastor, Sister Rose. Please welcome her as she comes. Thank you, God, for taking my place at Calvary when it could have been me and should have been me. Thank you. 
you, God, because you loved us more than anybody in the whole world. Thank you for the privilege it is to serve you and to live for you. I pray, God, that your power and your anointing in this place would be everywhere. I pray that you would touch the hearts of men and women, boys and girls. I pray that they would be touched as only you can give it to them. I pray, God, they would have an appreciation for the price that you paid and what a price it was. We're so grateful this morning to come and to worship you not only this morning but every morning, giving thanks to you for what you've done. I pray now, God, for the anointing upon thy servant, for without you I can do nothing. With you I can do everything. And we give you glory and honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Yes. We're happy that you're here today. A special welcome to you from Colorado Springs Fellowship. I hope that this is not the only time you go to church. We've got a lot of people for sure that only go to church on Easter and Christmas. And I say without a doubt that if somebody's willing to give their life for you, you should be willing to thank them every day of your life. Every day. It is a great time of celebration. I can say to you today, I don't know where I would be if it had not been for him coming and giving his life and dying for me, giving me another chance, a chance I did not deserve. But I thank him for it today. We're so happy for all of you that are here. I hope that you came expecting something from God. He's always giving things. He's always that. He's the gift that never stops giving. And we're grateful today that you're here. I'm going to preach to you a little while. And I want you to take note of this statue that we have here on the cross this morning. Everybody needs to see it. Last year we had, had it with the, with the movie showing what happened on that day. And we had this statue up there. I remember I called New York to see if somebody, uh, there was a man in the, on the Internet that said that he would he do specialty in certain type of statues. I called him and asked him about doing one. He said, he said so what you thinking of? I said, I'm thinking of a crucified Christ. Uh, I don't want it to be the pretty Christ because it's not the pretty one. He suffered for us. And he got real upset with me. And he said, why would you want to do such a thing as gross as that? I said, because he died on Calvary for me. And it was a gross death. He said, I wouldn't do that, Rose. He said, I wouldn't do that. He said, uh, people be standing outside my business after all these years. And they wouldn't want to do business with me if I created such a thing. And I said, well, I'm going to do it. And he said, therefore, he listened to me a little while. He said, well, why would you want to do it? I said, because he did it for me. This is a price that was done in my behalf. That's why I want to do it. He later told me, he said, Rose, you know I'm a Jew. I said, I don't care whether you're a Jew or whatever you are. We're talking about the suffering of Jesus. So I kept talking to him. And after a while, he said to me, Rose, if you find somebody to do that statue for you, he said, just let me know. I said, I will find somebody. He found somebody, I think, in Arizona who did this statue, and it depicts what really happened. It shows to Jesus the suffering that he went through for me and for you. And if some way I can get it across to people how important that is, that you give yourself to him, not holding back anything because he didn't hold back anything. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He gave everything that he had. There's not a parent in this room this morning who, is, uh, uh, who have some children, maybe more than one. He only had one son. He was willing to give everything that he had. There's not a parent here this morning would want to give not one of their children, even if they had several of them. They wouldn't want to give it. But I am grateful this morning for the grace of God that reached out to me. And the same grace reached out to you and says to you, you need to remember what I did for you. Understand that. Quit living your life nonchalant. Everything man has in the world today that is good, he has it because Jesus came and paid the price. If he had not come to Calvary, you and I wouldn't be alive today. If he had not come and given his life, we would have to go to hell. We wouldn't have a chance to go to heaven. So I'm grateful this morning for all that he did for me because he owed me nothing. He gave me everything. I appreciate it.
today. I'm going to read a little bit from St. Matthew, the ninth chapter, and the tenth verse. And it says that it came to pass, as Jesus said at meet in the house, behold, many publicans and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto his disciples, Why is your master with publicans and sinners? But when Jesus heard that, he said unto them, They that behold need not a physician, but they that are sick. But go ye and learn what this meaneth. I will have mercy and not sacrifice, for I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. I want to say to you this morning, if we don't understand anything else, we've got to understand one thing. Every person in this room has been sick and stricken by sin. Sin is like a disease. And when God looked down on the earth and saw the condition of man, he made up his mind, I must do something. Because man was created for God. Of course, he chose his own way to do his own thing. And as a result of that, he made a mess of his life. And God said, I got to fix this. Because you and I that made the mess of our own lives, God didn't, he didn't owe us nothing. But I'm glad he cared enough to say, I'm going to fix it for you. If nobody else appreciates it this morning, I truly appreciate the fact that he did it for me. Yes. He died because he looked at humanity and all of humanity was sick and stricken with a disease called sin. You did not have power over it not to do it, but rather we were slaves to sin. The thing that we said we wasn't going to do, we find ourselves doing it. We try to say I'm not going to be a bad person, but I am. We try to say I'm going to be a nice person, but you're not. So when you look at your life this morning, think of it for sure. All the things that you thought that you were going to do, you find out you didn't have the power to do it. So thank God for Jesus who came and gave us power. Power over sin. Power to say no. Power to say, I'm going to do it right. We did not have that at the beginning. I remember when Nancy Reagan many years ago came out with the slogan, just say no. And I thought to myself, it was, it was concerning drugs and what have you. And I thought to myself, how good would that be? If we all could just say no, it's not that simple. Because there's a greater power that controls your life than you. And that greater power is telling you to do this and you don't want to do it. So the Apostle Paul said, when I was to do it right, there was this thing inside of me pushing me to do it wrong. Every person in this building has experienced that. I didn't want to do that. I didn't want to go there. I, I wanted to do it like this, but for some reason, I couldn't help myself. You need to think about it this morning. Is that if he hadn't come, the type of person that I was, I was a horrible person. I couldn't stop. I wanted to. I had no power. I would say, I'm not going to do it today. I'm going to be a nice person. The truth is, I was not nice. You can't get nice out of bad. But God looked down and saw me and said, I'm going to help you because I see that you really want to do it, though you don't have the power to do it. And so I continued to push forward and telling myself, well, today is going to be a different day. I'm not going to say any curse words. I'm not going to get in any uh, conflict with anybody. Because I was very mean. They called me gangster girl. And a, a good name it was. And sometimes I thought, I've had my last fight. I ain't going to fight no more. Except my sisters would come and get me when their boyfriend didn't treat them right and say, uh, we're going to get Rose. Now, that's my older sister, mind you. We're going to go get Rose. And they came and got me. And I done the fighting. I'm talking men here, not boys, men. And I thought to myself, who wants to live their life continuously like this? Who wants to live their life that people hate to see you coming than to see you coming? Who wants to live that kind of life that you more or less is an outcast of our society 
simply by who you are. But Jesus cared enough. One day I looked up and I said, God, I'm so tired of me. I'm so tired of being this same evil person. I'm so tired of being where I am today. I want to be different, but I can't get there. A lot of you this morning sitting there, you'd like to be different, but you can't get there. You'd like to say, I'm not going down that road anymore. I'm not going to let anybody treat me like that. I'm not going to be abused. I'm not going to be treated badly and disrespected. And you find yourself back there again. How many teenagers today do we have in our society that are abused by their own boyfriends? And they say, I'm going to get away. And they try, and when you see them again, they're back with them. And they usually tell you, he didn't really mean it. You hit me one time, I know you meant it. And if you hit me one time, you'll never do it again. But I looked at these people, I'm thinking, God, help us today. This is a sick world with a bunch of sick people in it. And God said, I want to heal you. I want to make you whole. He said, I came not for those that were already fixed. I came for those so that I can help you and make you whole. We need to quit believing. We need to quit believing that other people and things is going to make us complete. Wholeness is a place of completeness. And so you, nobody is going to make you complete but God. Because man by nature is selfish anyway. He is thinking of himself and not you. So understand this, that God said, I need to make you whole, a complete person. How many people get married, believe in their mate, it's going to complete them? I say it is not true. No matter how good he is, it is not true. Because nobody can complete you but God. And when we choose other things and other people in which to make our lives better, oh, you know, since I met him, you just wouldn't believe how good my life is now. It won't last. It won't last. You know why it won't last? Because that person who you say is doing everything you need, and I just feel like a whole person now, is going to wake up one day, and he's going to want somebody to make him feel whole. And you're not capable of it. Stop for a minute. He said, I didn't come for those who are already doing okay. I came for those that were sick. I want to bring you healing. I want to bring you power in your life. I want to put you in a place you've never been before. I want to show you what living is all about. He said, I came that you might have life and that you might have abundant life. I want you to have a good time. There's too many people that don't even know how to live. I'm telling you, you don't know how to live till Jesus comes into your heart and he empowers you. You cannot live. He said, I want you to have abundant life. But the enemy doesn't want you to have abundant life. And people serve the devil every day with full knowledge. He cares nothing about you, but you're, he's going to try to destroy you if he can. Yes. So I say to you this morning, as you look at your life, what does it mean to you to be whole? And the word whole simply means physically and mentally and emotionally and spiritually sound, complete, entire, wanting nothing, lacking nothing. Everything I say I want it, I have it. See? This whole implies that nothing has been omitted, ignored, abated, or taken away. Entire may suggest a state of completeness, perfection, to which nothing can be added. Can you imagine your life so complete you couldn't add one thing to it? Only God can give you that kind of completeness. Only God can work that in you. So Jesus says, I come to make it all right to fix it. Why are you concerned about the people that I'm sitting having lunch with? I am come to help these people to make it right. I want to fix it for them. I want to be sure that they're not alone, that they're not somewhere in a corner crying and depressed. We got more depressed people in this country that's on some type of psychic drug, trying to lift this unbelievable uh, thing off of them, not knowing quite what it is. Understand that. They go to the doctor and say, I don't know what's wrong with me. And, and he asks you a few questions, and he says, I don't know, I just don't know what's wrong with me. Because for the most part, now shouldn't I be sad to have a good job? I have a good husband, I have a good wife, I have children who love me, I have 
fall apart. Why am I depressed? Because the thing that makes you whole and keep depression away is Jesus. And that's the one we say we don't want right now. That's not what I'm looking for. Yes. That's not what I'm looking for. I'm looking for something more than that. That's what they say. So they get high on drugs. They take alcohol. They do all these things trying to fix something that's wrong. And only Jesus can fix what's wrong. So I want to know what's happening to me. You talk to your friends, they can't help you. You try to explain what you're going through, they don't know. And so all of these things are happening in your life. Why am I so messed, mixed up and messed up? Jesus knew, God knew that you were messed up. He said, I'm going to help you. I'm going to fix, show you a way out. I'm going to show you which way you should go. I'm going to lead you. I'll guide you. I'll hold you by the hand. And when you get to the point in your life that you feel like you're too weak to stand up, he said, I'll lift you up. Everything you need, I'll give it to you. And still, we don't want to serve him. We don't want to serve him. So it's like, what can I do? Something else. Look, there's people sitting in this room this morning I've never seen before. Rest assured, I probably will not see again. It's Easter Sunday. You get up and go to church. Everybody goes to church on Easter Sunday. How would you like to have a person in your life who says they love you? But you only see them once a year. That's at Easter time. How would you like that? You know what you'd say to a friend or somebody? You know, I'm going to have to let him go. Because you know what? He only shows up once a year. Nobody wants that kind of relationship. I want a relationship where I know that you care about me. You come to see me every day. That's called love. But when I see you every now and then, it really doesn't matter if I don't see you today. I told people about my husband when we were, when we were dating. And he would come to see me every day at my mom's house. And he would walk as far from here, I would say, as far as Southgate is from this north end of town. Every day in the hot sun, he'd come and see me. And my mother said to me one day, don't you get tired of him? I said, of course not. I love him. The fact that he can walk that far to come and see me because he did not have a car. He didn't have any money. But it wasn't about all that. See, that's why people don't stay married long. Everybody's wanting things, things. Give me this, give me that, give me that. We didn't have much anything. It was and happy all over the place. Come to see me every day in the St. Louis hot sun and sit there and in the evening would leave and take that long walk back all the way past Southgate. We figured that up one time, how many miles that were, but was, but I forget what it was. Long, long way. And every day, he would get on that journey again and come to spend time with me. You don't want to spend time with God. You can't get people to worship the Lord twice on Sunday. Sunday night church, my God, I'm not a fanatic or anything. I'm not into all this Jesus stuff. So I really don't want, I mean, go to church on Sunday night. You know, a lot of churches in this town don't even have services on Sunday night because nobody wants to go back. But when somebody's been very good to you, somebody who's really loved you, you really can't do enough. No matter how you look at it, what else can I do? And if it means going back to church on Sunday night saying thank you again, you owe that to him. Go back and say thank you. Well, I said it this morning, you know, for God's sake, you know, we have to have a life. You don't have one without God. You may think you do, but you don't have one without God. If you really want to be happy, if you really want to know what true happiness is and what fulfillment is, it's not in all these things that we think is going to make us feel good. It's in God. And we keep running around him and running around him and say, I'm looking for something. Here he is. Here he is. Right here. Suffering for you, bleeding, being nailed to the cross. We have a paper in the church that's called the Physician's View of Calvary. How a doctor viewed what happened to him when they put him on the cross. Sad. They didn't put the nails, we often say they put the nails in his hand, they put it here. Now that is uncomprehendable pain. That's 
If they had put it in his hands, he would have ripped down from the cross. And he put it here. And the spikes were like, I think, nine inches long. And they knocked through here. This is a, this is a nerve here that is uncomprehendable. You don't want to damage that. They put him on the cross. They nailed him. They stuck a spear in his side as if that wasn't enough. They put a crown of thorns on his head. And they hung him up. Can you imagine the weight of your body pulling down from here? That's uncomprehendable. And then they made a little tiny seat that he could rest his buttocks on to prevent him just ripping off and coming down that cross. I, when I read the physician's view, I couldn't help but cry. I thought, my God, all the things that happened to him. And you know what? He eventually died because of love. He stayed up on the cross because love held him there. Because he had you in mind, he had me in mind, everybody in this room, he had you in mind. Thinking about you, when every pain he suffered, every drop of blood that fell to the earth, it was about you. And then you walk all around it every day and don't take the time to say, God, I thank you. I remember going to Florida one year with my husband before he passed away to on vacation. And I love the ocean. Wouldn't dare get in it, but I love it. And so I'd sit on my balcony and I'd look at the ocean. And I'd think of all the scriptures that, that was in scripture about the ocean and how it functions and how God commanded it not to leave the not to leave a certain place. And when he came in, it could only stop. It had to stop there. You see the waves, they go out like this, and then they come back in like this, but they always stop. God ordained them not to cross that. So I was sitting on the, on the deck, and I was looking at the ocean, and God, it was, it was just overwhelming. It was so huge, and yet it was such a small piece of who God was. And I thought, my God, look at that ocean. I loved it. And I said to my nephew who came up to visit me while I was there, and I said, hey, how do you feel about the ocean? Isn't it exciting? He said, I really don't pay much attention to it. Because you live here. But if I didn't live here, it would still be the same. Because it's the magnificent power and majesty of who he is. And it's only just a small part of it. I was so overwhelmed. And I see all these people laying on the beach and getting a tan and, and all sizes and all colors. And it was amazing. And I thought to myself, I wonder do anybody ever look up and say, thank you for the sun. They look, those are sun lovers in Florida. I mean, you see everybody in a swimsuit. Unbelievable. I said, are you kidding me? You didn't have to have a bikini body. I saw people that had uh, a sheet towel wrapped around like this, hanging, going to the beach and laying back in the sun. I'm thinking, no, you didn't. Of all things, you couldn't have. And I, I got my, my camera out and I, I zoomed in. And the whole time I was zooming in, I thought, oh, no, you didn't. And it seems like nobody pays attention. Everybody's trying to get a tan. I'm so glad I was born with mine. I'm glad I don't have to lay in the sun. My daughter left me in the sun one time at my house on the deck, and, and, and the sun had come over, and I went to sleep sitting in the chair. And I never do that. And... She forgot I was out there, went on in the house doing something, left me out there in the sun. And I came in, this was all real dark, all of this. All of this is real dark. And I started peeling after it. I thought, what is this? Because I'd never been in the sun before and got a, a tan. I, could, I didn't believe I could tan anymore. And, and I, I said, I thought, my daughter, I said, never leave me on the deck. Let me know you're going in the house. I don't want to just stay out here. Look at this. I don't know how long. I kept peeling and peeling and peeling. Then I, when I went to California on vacation, I was 
so beautiful. The ocean is, oh my God. And I sit out on the, on the deck and I put my legs up on the table. I ended up with a half tan leg. Because my socks, I haven't had socks on my feet. And so from the sock up, I got a tan. And I, at, at first I didn't notice it right away. And then I, I was lotioning my legs one day. And I said, why is this part of my leg dark? Two-tone rose. Yeah. And I realized, oh, that's a tan. So I had one leg that was even color, the other was two, two colors. But perhaps it was sitting over like this. And so when I see this, and, and, and our, our, our room where we were was right over the, over the swimming pool and then to the ocean, and these people were laying out there for literally hours in the sun getting a tan, even though there is a chance that it's a very good chance that you could get cancer from that unless you protect yourself. But I'm looking saying, who looks up and say thank you? Who looked up this morning when you got out of bed and said, God, thank you, I can get up. Thank you, I can breathe. Thank you, I can dress myself. Thank you because there's a lot of people who can't dress themselves. There's a lot of people that couldn't get out of bed this morning. There's a lot of people that had to have somebody to come and help them to get up. Get up. Did you stop this morning? Just one moment to say, thank you. Thank you that I'm alive today. Thank you that I'm well. Thank you I'm not sick. Thank you for all that you've done for me. How many people did it? When you sit here this morning, you think, oh, I never thought about that. I can move my arm. I can stand up. I can walk. These are all things that we don't just have to have. And I wonder sometimes do you ever think about the price he paid for you to have all of this. All of this. What a price. And I often say this. He paid the price without a guarantee. We never spend money for anything that's of value that we want a guarantee on it. Otherwise, we don't want to spend the money for it. Because if something happens to this, I want to know I got a guarantee and I can come back. And you or you'll stand behind it and fix it or give me a new one. But he gave his life with no guarantee that you were going to serve him. No guarantee that I would. No guarantee that anybody in this room was going to serve him. But he did it anyway because he loved you that much. I think it's time that we love him back. We love him back. Sin is always going to be in the earth. But you can be protected because the blood of Jesus is applied to your life and protects you from the, from the pain of sin. All the things that go with that. The blood takes care of it. So you look at your life this morning and say, wait a minute. I take a lot for granted. You have children that could not have been born healthy. You, could have, you had children who didn't have to be born with two eyes and a mouth and, and two hands and, and who could move and cry. You didn't, you didn't have to have that. We act like that's just going to happen because that's the way I want things. Not so. It is God that stands behind everything that happens in our life. It is God that gives us the good and not the bad. All good and perfect gifts come from above. Everything comes from him. Yes. You need to look at yourself this morning and say, am I just an Easter Sunday morning person? Will it be Christmas before I come back to say thank you? The more you say thank you, the more he wants to love on you. The more he wants to do for you. But at least thank me for what I've already done. Thank me for the price I already paid. You need to do that. Yes. People say, well, we don't go to church all the time. You know, we go sometime, but that's why your life's a mess. That's why you're depressed. That's why you're down and out. That's why you don't know where you're going to go, how I'm going to do this. And every crisis that comes in your life, you become the crisis. You have nothing there to help you to get through it. I thank God from the depths of my heart for what he has done for me. I had seven children, one set of twins. And all of them was born normal. So they came of age and I thought they were all, some of them were crazy. Yes. But when they were babies, they were normal. I didn't have no problems. 
They cry for a bottle, I give it to them. They want their diaper changed, we change it. But they keep growing up. The more they grow, the more problems you have. And don't let them get sweet 13. Because they know more than you know. And I felt the same way. My brother said, don't bring that word uh, teenager in my house. It makes you think you're grown and you know everything. Don't bring it in the house. And I was telling everybody, I'm, I'm going to be I'm going to be a teenager. When I was 12, I'm getting ready to turn 13. I'm going to be a teenager. That was the thing, to be a teenager. We were all crazy. <laughs> Doing a bunch of crazy stuff. We didn't feel like uh, that the older people, our parents or what have you, uh, uh, could really tell us anything. We've got it going on. We know what's happening. But I'm thankful today for the grandmother who stood there for me and told me the truth even when I didn't want to hear it. Even when I felt like when she was whipping me, she was whipping me with that peach tree switch, I wanted to take it and whip her back. But today I am grateful because through all of that, God made the person that I am today. Thank him for that. You know what you'll say? You know, when she was talking, I thought to myself, I should get it together. I should do better than I'm doing. You know, she's right. And then they leave church and they go on and say, and somebody says, do you, you want to go back tonight? Well, not really. You know, we, we went this morning. You know, come on. We're not... We're not all that into Jesus stuff. I tell you, you better be into Jesus stuff. Because your whole life, you're going to need him. Every day, every day, you're going to need him. Don't sit him aside and keep pushing him aside. You're going to need him. <laughs> Many crises in my life. If I had not had God, I don't know where I would be. I don't know how I would have went through it. <laughs> I lost my husband very suddenly with a brain aneurysm. We've been married 29, 30, 33 years. And suddenly, suddenly, he's gone. I needed somebody in my life bigger than my children, bigger than the friends, bigger than the church. I needed help. I promised him I'd always preach his funeral if he went before me, which I did. Probably was the easiest day that I had. And I remember thinking, I didn't have to ask where is God? Because I knew he was there. He was helping me to get through this unbelievable crisis. How do you get through this, this horrible nightmare? You're going to need God. Every person in this room has crisis. Every person in this room has a storm. Every person in this room comes to a dark time in your life. If you live long enough, you're going to come to a darkness. And you're going to need the light of God to help you to lift you up. <laughs> yes. He can help you if you let him. He got me through. Four years later, lost my daughter at 29 years old. Preached her funeral. Difficult. I had yet not stopped grieving my, my husband's death when my daughter passed away. And I thought, if I didn't have God, where would I be? What would I do? How do you pick up the pieces that's broken and put them back together again and walk without somebody bigger than you? I had to have somebody bigger than I was, stronger than I was, who could see what I couldn't see. And help me to walk down this road and come out completely whole and not literally in millions of pieces. This morning, look at your life. You may say, I don't need him now. You're going to need him. You're going to need him more than you will ever know. Just to get, just to live every day and get through what we need to get through. And say, no. I got somebody bigger than me. We sing the song, somebody bigger than you and I. Who did all these things? Who made this beautiful world? Who gave me a place to live and food on the table? Who, who has provided all of this? I didn't just have to have it. There's a lot of people who don't have it. We have more homeless people doing this tenure than we've ever seen. All across America. Homeless people, no place to live. 
but a tragedy. And they still don't want to serve God. I'm trying to say, why are you? Why would you go? David said, I was young. Now I'm old. I've never seen the righteous forsaken or his seed beg bread. He said, I'll provide for you. If you serve me, you serve the devil. He gives you nothing. He gives you nothing. Listen. Take the image you see on the cross this morning with you. Think about it. This is a horrible death. The death that they, the way they killed him was, was really reserved for some of the worst criminals ever living. And they gave it to him. And he said yes. And when he went through the Garden of Gethsemane to pray because the load seems unbearable, he now says, Father, if it be your will, let this cup pass from me. But he saw me. He saw you. And he said, nevertheless, that's okay, that's okay. I'll do it. I'll do it. Because every person in this room, he bore your sins on that cross. He bore your sins. What are you going to do about it? Back in the day, they said, away with him. I don't want God in my life. Away with him. Barabbas was a murderer. And at that time of the year, they had to do one or the other. And you tell us which one you want us to, to let go and which one you want us to kill. And they said, let Barabbas go. He's a murderer, but release him. But kill Jesus. Crucify him. The people are saying the same thing today. You say, I didn't say nothing like that. Your life depicts what you're saying. How you live your life every day says exactly how you feel. Away with him. I'm trying to live my life, do things my way. This is what I want to do. He said, I want you to serve me. I want you to love me. I want you to take a moment out of your time for me. And you say, I just don't have the time. I'm busy. If death knocks on your door today, it won't, ma it won't matter how busy you are. You're out of here. You're out of here. So I can't do that. You know, this is something that I just can't do. It's not, I know my oldest brother told me that one time when I talked to him about the Lord. He was highly educated and stupid at the same time. I tried to talk to him about his soul. He said, Rose, I don't have time, he said. Busy. He had this job and he was overseeing this entire hospital in Miami. He had a beautiful home, swimming pool and all. Two sons, Anthony and Andrew. But he said, I don't have time. You don't understand. I'm busy. But it came a time in his life that he could no longer be busy. Now he's stricken with Parkinson's disease. Now, he can't, his hands shake continuously. He cannot even write the checks. He cannot do anything anymore. Because now he says, but back then, I don't have time. What about now? We never know from day to day what we're going to wake up with. You can go to bed perfectly normal and wake up sick. I said, well, what happened? I went to bed last night. I felt terrific. I got a good night's sleep, but I got up this morning, and everything just went crazy. Because we have no control over our life, how each day is going to go don't know. This morning while you sit here and listen to this and I cannot tell you enough of all that he went through for me and for you that you could be free. Come on, give him give him some time. You could say, I'm going to make Sunday God's day. I'm going to church Sunday morning and I'm going Sunday night. That's going to be his day. You got six other days. We don't even want to give him that. He was willing to give everything for you. So you stop a minute and say, okay, I'm going to do that. There's enough forces of hell that's going to try its best to keep you from ever making a commitment to God. And every time you try to make one, something else comes to try to keep you from doing it. And you say, every time I make a plan that I'm going to really do that and I'm going to, uh, make this commitment to God. Things just happen. They didn't just happen. Uh, the devil himself said, I'm going to do everything I can to keep you from serving God. You got to make a decision. What are you going to do? Eventually, you're going to die. All of us is going to die. When you come to the last hour, the last minute, last second of your life, 
What would you have done for him? Did you live a life that he was pleased with it? Did you live a life of thanksgiving? Did you live a life saying, I appreciate you? What did you do with your life? Because when you come to the end, the only thing that's going to matter at that point is what you did for God. Anything else you do, it really doesn't matter. If you get an education, if you get a bachelor's, if you get a Ph.D., whatever you get, none of those things are going to matter in the end. What are you going to do? Just now and think about it. I don't want you just to let this be something that, well, for the moment I thought about it. I want you to get a picture of that statue right behind me. The suffering, the agony, the pain, all for us. And you said I don't have time for God? Come on. Surely you have time for him. Or you will surely wish that you had. A time is coming. For it is appointed unto every man and woman, boy and girl, to die. And after that, to the judgment. It's appointed. We all had an appointed time. From the time we were born, we have a time we're going to die. And you don't know if yours is soon or later. There is no thing that says, well, you, you're gonna, everybody's going to die at 60 or 70 years old. There's nothing that says that. Young people die. Babies die. Children die. Think about it. When is your time coming? You mean I never hear this message again. Never. You say, but you're going to hear it today. You say, if I was a little closer to the door, I'd make my, I'd let, make my escape. No, don't listen. Because he cares about you. He wants the best for you. He wants you to have full life. Live life to its fullest. I said to people sometimes, you got to learn how to live. If I die tomorrow, I have lived a good life. I enjoyed it. I served God. I raised my children to love him, to serve him. I did something good with the time allotted to me. What are you doing with the time allotted to you? Stop for a moment. Say, you know what? I need to get serious about this. When you leave this building today, if somebody accompanies you to the service, there will be at least one in that group that says, well, yeah, but hey, we're young. We've got time. You're going back to church. Come on, don't turn to a fanatic on us. Leave them. Leave them. You, you're not connected. Yes. So go on, do it yourself. When I gave my heart to the Lord, my husband said, I'm not ready for that. He was in the military at the time. He said, I'm not ready for that, Rose. I got to deal with these soldiers every day. You got to curse them out every day. I said, but you can serve God. Not ready. I went on anyway for me. Because whether he needed him not, he needed the Lord then or not, I did. I said, well, this is what I want to do with my life. He said, do it. I support you. I want him to the Lord 13 years after I got, was, gave my heart to the Lord. I want him to the Lord, and I'm glad I did. The greatest thing I ever did in my life was to win my husband. And, and know that when he left this world, suddenly with a brain aneurysm, that he was in the hand of God. Thank God for that. But we had a great life. You know, people are unhappy on their jobs. They're unhappy in their marriages. They're unhappy with their children. They're unhappy, unhappy, unhappy. He said, but I want to make you whole. If you, if you, try, to make you, if you try to use your children to make you whole, you're not going to be whole. If you try to get somebody, my sister, my friend, or whoever, to help me to feel complete, you're going to be disappointed. So I come that you might have what? Abundant life. I'm going to show you what real living is all about. We have fun every day. We're enjoying life because it could be gone tomorrow. While you sit there this morning thinking about this and I never gave it much thought. It's Easter Sunday. What do we do? We boil eggs. We dye them. We deal with the little bunny. We do some chocolates. That's not what Easter's about. While you're sitting there eating boiled eggs, that's not what it's about. More than the chocolate rabbit. 
Come on, that rabbit couldn't help you if he wanted to. He's chocolate. But you'll sit there and enjoy every minute of, boy, this is delicious. But it can't make you happy. When you get through consuming it, the rabbit is gone. Where is he? Somewhere. Done. You know what's that feeling in life that everybody somehow have, goes through this? It's where I feel this void there, but I'm not quite sure what it is. And then I'll maybe go get some food. I find out, no, that's not what I want. So then I do something else. And then it still didn't do it. And I go here, and I, it still didn't do it. What is it? It's the place that God's supposed to feel in your life, and you have made it your point not to let him be there. Think about it. He wants to make you happy. I have, I have a good life. I have many things to thank God for. Many things, and you do too. Whether you take the time to do it or not is another story, but everybody that's sitting in this place this morning, oh God, something. You owe that to him. Give him the time. So I'm going to make it a point to do that. That's why you're where you're at. That's why you're messed up. That's why you're confused. That's why you feel this void in your life. That's why you're looking for somebody to complete you, to finish you, to make you what you would like to be. Sin is incurable without God. It can't, nobody can cure it. Medicine can't cure it. It takes God to do it. How many people go to a psychologist, they don't know what's wrong with them, so they, sit, so they get on the couch and they, and they tell them what's wrong with them and he's asking you all the questions and you come out and diagnose your own case. So, oh, you got such and such, that's what I thought. And then you pay him a nice sum of money. My cousin, my cousin was a psychologist and, and he was crazy as his patients. He needed somebody to talk to. Somebody he could share with. You sit there and listen to them issues all day long and get up and you feel bad for people and you're worried about them and all these things until he got depressed. I don't want to talk to somebody that's like me. I want to talk to somebody that's bigger than me, and that's God. He can make the difference in my life. You can have it this morning. It's not difficult. It's just a matter of saying, Lord, I'm a sinner. I need you to come into my life, change my life, make me a new person, empower me to serve you, and that I'm not a slave to sin anymore in my life. And you can die a slave to sin. It is your job to be sure you change that. But I want to change things. Give it a try. You tried everything else and you always come up with something missing. Give him a try. You will never, ever find that anything was missing with him. I've been serving the Lord for 50 years. It's a great life. I wouldn't have it absolutely no other way. Because with him, I have life. With him, no matter what the issues are, He's taking me through every one of them. He can take you through yours. I hope this morning that you realize Easter is not about all these other things. It's about the person who loved you enough to say, I came to make you whole. I came to give you life. I came to make you happy. I came to give you joy. Come on, you can have that. So while you're sitting there this morning with our musicians and singers come forward, and if you're sitting there, you say, Sister Rose, I think that's what's wrong with me. I haven't really given God my all. I, had, I go to church sometime, but I really don't commit to anything. Your life is never going to be better until you do. And it's not difficult. You need a healing from the sin that dominates your life, that makes you do things that you said you would never do. Because a lot of people say, I would never do drugs, I'll never do alcohol, but they did it. God can give you the power not to do it and make you happy every day. And you don't need a drug for a high, a drug for a low, a drug, a drug to go to sleep, a drug to wake up. Come on. He can fix it for you. While our singers and musicians are playing, I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet.